fear is not the enemy. Comfort is. And so many people come to our community. Um, we call ourselves fear bosses. This means we're the boss, not our fear. It doesn't mean that we don't get afraid. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that fear doesn't exist, but we have chosen to face it. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden, and I'm so excited to have my next guest here, who is not only a total badass keynote speaker, podcaster, comedian, CEO, and author of the book, Fear is My Homeboy, How to Slay Doubt, Boss Up, and Succeed on Your Own Terms. Welcome, welcome, Judy. Oh, thank you, Karen. It's so good to be here. And it seems like we both have a love affair with, with slaying doubt and overcoming doubt and uh, moving through it and moving with it. And so it's just, it's an, it's an honor to be here for real. I absolutely, if you go to judyholler.com, she has just a few videos there that really talks about your backstory. And yeah. I, Remember looking at it and was just blown away. And I knew who you were, but actually, I mean, you just did an amazing job on that as well. Thank but you. also just it's so inspirational on so many levels. So Judy is, as I mentioned, has done a lot. She wears a lot of hats, uh, like yeah. many of us, but she's also jack of all trades and truly embodies the spirit of creative entrepreneur mm. and uh, her company that she's the CEO of is called Hola Productions and Hala, 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 <laughs> Hala, Hala, sorry, CEO of Hala Productions. And she, as I mentioned, is a podcast host and author of the best selling book, Fear is My Homeboy, How to Slay Doubt, Boss Up and Succeed on Your Own Terms. And if that isn't enough to impress you, then we're just <laughs> going to keep chatting a little bit about some of the other amazing stuff that she's doing. In her own words, she's a bona fide improv nerd who <laughs> is obsessed with helping people live a braver life and lead brave braver teams as well so anyway thank you so much for joining so let's dive right in you started out studying and performing improv theater talk to me a little bit about that how did you get there first of all like where did you grow up all of that kind of cool. stuff all the things okay so I am a St. Louis girl, born and raised in the Midwest. By the way, my husband's an ASU guy. So funny oh. story. We have a connection to Arizona as well. And so um my husband told me to tell you, go devils. But I am, have no connection to Scottsdale or Arizona or that area. But I grew up in the Midwest um, and moved from St. Louis, Missouri uh, to Chicago, Illinois, by way of a big promotion in sales and marketing. I worked in the hotel industry. Hospitality was sort of my background. And I grew from property level sales, working in big convention hotels, booking big conventions to regional sales where I represent companies like Marriott, Starwood, back when there was a Starwood, Omni, et cetera. And I was responsible for bringing and growing uh, business in those hotel collections. So I opened hotels and uh, was based in Chicago. And it was an incredible career. And I knew that when I got to Chicago, I had this feeling that I was going to have to try improv. So I have a little bit of a theater background, but I was never a theater kid. I did like speech and I loved like the sales presentations when I was working in sales and marketing. I loved storytelling. I loved finding unique ways to get people's attention. And I've always naturally loved to orate. I love to talk. I love to tell stories and I love to find a way to do that differently. And so I thought, Improv could help me sharpen that skill. And little did I know that just going to take a class, the basic classes, the classes anybody could go take, um, by the way, at the age of 30, 
So I think that's important. I think a lot of people think, oh, my God, I'm too late or who yeah. am I? I'm too old. They're, you know, everybody's going to make fun of me and I'm not smart enough. I'm not funny enough. All this stuff. Right. Um, and I tell this story in my keynote. One of my signature stories is the story of how I went at 30, Kara, and then I left. Like I quit. I lied. I said I was in the wrong place. I was supposed to be at Starbucks and I left. And it took me two years to go back to Second City. So at 32, essentially, I took my first ever basic improv class caught the bug, um, and ended up auditioning for the conservatory, the professional program after a few years, got in, stayed in, and am an alum. Can I jump in for a second? So, so when you left, so did you leave because you were booed off the stage or what, yeah. what kind Great of? Great question. Yeah. What happened? what happened? I was so afraid. It was fear and fear alone. I was afraid that I was too old, that I was too late, that all these 20-somethings were going to uh, boo me off the stage or make fun of me or that I had missed my chance. And so I quit. And, you know, the big idea is wouldn't it be great if we could stop, you know, allowing fear to make our decisions, to stop uh, missing opportunities because fear, you know, has has started to call the shots in our life. And and I quit that day and I regretted it for, for quite some time and went back two years later. And it's funny, in my keynote, I end up flashing this, this photo on the stage, but it's the photo of my very first ensemble. So when I went back at 32, I mustered up the courage. I was reading a lot of Brene Brown and books on courage. And I, I finally mustered the courage up to go back. And the first human being I saw in that room was a woman named Shelly, who at the time was a 55 year old University of Chicago professor taking improv to think on her feet. And there was a guy named Frank who was 56 years old sales guy taking improv to become a better presenter. And it was this melting pot of humans all looking for something different. What I found, what I went for was some presentation skills and to have some fun and meet people. I was single and living in Chicago. But what I got was courage in a way that I never thought I'd get it because here I was doing things on the improv stage that made me really brave in front of hundreds of people with no script. And you know what it did, Kara? It made me boss up in the boardroom. I started like asking for raises. I started speaking up to the toxic person at work. I moved to new cities. I left bad relationships. I'd sit in the front row at meetings. So yeah, there it all began. There it all began. And I just started talking about it. I'd ask my sales director, can I lead the sales meeting? I learned this really cool thing at improv. I think our team could use it. And I would just speak for free to anyone who would listen. And I have turned it into a full-time speaking and creating and writing career on fear, courage, and confidence. That's amazing. That is so great. So did you, like like growing up, were you funny? Did your friends think you were funny? I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's funny. A, A lot of my friends today will share stories where they all knew I was going to be an entrepreneur, but I always call myself an accidental entrepreneur. They were like, you were planning a kids camp at age 12, you know, and you were just like, come on, it'll be fun. We'll charge five bucks. You had no idea what you were talking about, but I, I just was able to kind of convince people, you know, I was leading them, but I didn't call it leading then. Mm. I was like, I, you know, it was my idea and I would, I would do it. But, Anyway, I'm I'm so curious. Like, did you think you were like, did people think you were funny or did you think, think you were funny or, or I still know that like it's so funny. We're our toughest critics and we're the hardest on ourselves. Um, humor has always been a part of my life and I've mm-hmm. always made people laugh. And I I feel like energy is my superpower. And so I work really hard to 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 generate energy. You know, I think power plants don't wake up with energy. They generate it, right? And so I, I work hard on that, knowing it's my superpower. But comedy, you know, I'm not, I'm definitely not a stand-up comedian. But I, I think I know how to make people laugh. I think I know how to trust myself enough to turn the volume up on the gifts um, I that it. I have and the things that I see in the world that may be humorous, right? And so it's been fun for me to use comedy and use humor to help people have more fun, playful conversations about fear, because why do we allow fear to call the shots? Like, why do they have to be scary conversations? Why can't the title of my book is 
all about befriending fear. That's what it means to consider it a friend, to invite it into your life and to sort of throw a party for it because it's a, either going to keep you alive, right? Or totally. fear can do really good things for us, or it can point you in a direction maybe you need to go. And, you know, speaking of books, as I was reading your book, I mean, I heard story after story after story of you doing that time and time mm-hmm. again, right? Having that playful conversation, um, you know, okay, here's what we can't do, but what can we do? What can mm-hmm. we do? And that is the yes fan mantra in the improv theater that allows me to stay in forward momentum. So am I funny? Maybe. I just do what feels right. And if I'm not having fun, what's the point? And when I think we see people be joyful, that that's kind of contagious, you know? I see so much of your journey, like there's so many parallels to your point in, in my book, I, I talk about this, but I talk about fear all the time oh, that yeah. it's that what I've gained from it. And I learned it early on as an athlete, as a gymnast. And, you know, I learned lots of things like there would I'd always want better people on my team because I'd be learning from them. And that's how we ultimately won. And by having better people and also just the idea that you're, you know, you're going to be good at things and there's other things that you're not going to be that great at and you should just enjoy yourself and oh, I right, and more. keep learning along yeah. the way. You had this section, you know, in your book that really, really, well, I underlined and highlighted because it's all about the the power of the ensemble. One of the things you you train in your company, and this is a great lesson for everyone to remember because the improv theater is not a me sport. It's a we sport. It's all about the the, the ensemble. I, I cannot improvise alone. I need the ensemble. And I my only job, when I am there on stage and I translate this into my life, being here with you on this podcast, when I'm with the client, when I'm serving a keynote audience, it is never about me. It is how, how can I make this human being, how can I see them? How mm-hmm. can I make them feel incredible? And when I'm on stage as an improviser, my only job is to make them look amazing, which makes me look great. That's a cool side effect. But when you have in your heart the intention of protecting your ensemble and really looking out for other people, um, it's really hard to lose. And is it easy to do? No, but it's a powerful thing that a lot of, a lot of people don't don't remember, right? It's not about you because we never get anywhere alone. So you have a lot of those tenets in your book too about the ensemble and how you train your team. You know, how can you make your supervisor? How can you help them? How can you Mm -hmm. solve a problem? How can you make their life easier? Yeah. And I think it's also about, I mean, call them customers or audience. I mean, they're all kind of, they're similar in many ways that people have always asked me, what would you What would you not do? Mm. Or I don't know how you phrase it, but I think for me, just having a feedback loop and where while some people are really afraid of that. Yeah. Right. That they're afraid of going on stage. I used I was always a very social person, but until I actually started doing public speaking and Mm. frankly, I felt like I kept getting asked, especially in building my company Hint being a female entrepreneur, there, you know, lots of different opportunities. And finally, I just said, I need to just get over this. And mm-hmm. people thought it was ridiculous because I was so social. They're, they're like, of course, you can go do this. And the thing that I realized in my public speaking that I was or really my fear was that I read audiences mm-hmm. like I'm always really wanting to understand before a keynote exactly who's here are they entrepreneurs are they executives are they moms are they you know what what's going on here are they college students are they you know who is this that that's here and so the problem with that is that for me to have a deck is very confining and so when i started to figure that out then I started being the keynote speaker that I don't have a deck. Isn't that great? I love that when I read yeah, that. And like, so, yes. Yeah, and so I don't have a deck. And and all of a sudden it was like liberating. Yes. I, no deck. I'm like, I'm, and then I just started trying to, yes. but because people said, no, you have to have decks. And then I have actually changed conferences now who had like 
not, been not comfortable with the idea that I was not going to do a deck. And Ooh. then they said, your keynote actually shifted our mind mm. into because you're having a conversation with the audience. And anyway, so for so those powerful. of you who fear public speaking, check into whether or not it's the deck situation and how much you want it, that feedback loop with the audience and and all that. But I love how humor has played such a critical part of your work because I think it's humor is happiness, right? Mm. Like for people, and especially if you're the recipients of it and you're able to allow people to laugh with you, laugh at you along the way. I just think it's something where you leave audiences feeling hopeful. Yeah. Do you receive a lot of comments back from people yes. as well and emails? And and it feels great, right? Like to know that you're actually, just by being in front of them, you're actually helping them understand that Yes, and right yes. that they can that they can go on. That's that's so super super awesome. So you and I have shared thinking on smashing comfort zones, mm-hmm. obviously. Oh, yes. And I'm going to quote you on this: "Fear isn't the enemy; mm-hmm. comfort is." I'm obsessed with high performance habits and helping people get more comfortable about being uncomfortable. Can yes. you share a little bit about what you mean by that? Yes, I absolutely can. And I 100% believe um, fear is not the enemy. Comfort is. And so many people come to our community. Um, we call ourselves fear bosses. This means we're the boss, not our fear. It doesn't mean that we don't get afraid. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that fear doesn't exist. But we have chosen to to face it. And so I think we have to first start with the rant on fearless that I think you and I both agree on. Uh, I do not believe fearless exists, right? There is no fearless. And there's this great book. Have you read the book Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert yet? I have not. And I love Elizabeth Gilbert. She's amazing, but I have not read it. Put it on your list. It's, it's, uh, it, it is incredible. It's Big Magic. Subtitle, Creative Living Beyond Fear. So it's this really beautiful book on fear and its journey in her life. And she wrote this about, and it was the, the book I was reading on my honeymoon when I came up with the idea for Fear is My Homeboy. So that book forever is like sort of, you know, um, ingrained in my heart and in my life. But she said, listen, the only fearless people I know are five-year-olds and sociopaths. So. I don't true. think we, it's so true. Like, right? we don't want to be five again. We love a good five year old, but we don't want to be five. And no. we're not sociopaths. So the goal should be fearless. It should be figuring out how to fear our fear just a little bit less. So the way we do that in the fear boss community, because people come to our community, they read the books, they buy the planner, they go through the course, whatever it may be. Um, and they want to be braver and they want more freedom and they want to smash those comfort zones, but. What they find out they really need, and these are the tools we provide, and I bet you'll agree, they find out they need energy, stamina, Mm -hmm. focus, confidence, Mm -hmm. and the high-performance habits that are going to get you brave and keep you brave. So the way we do that in the Fear Boss community is we encourage people, this is our I, idea on fear, a twist on fear. We encourage people to become fear scientists with us. So this means that we are out there conducting fear experiments on the regular in order to get more comfortable being uncomfortable. So we are putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations to get braver. So those, Kara, could be really big things, right? So maybe it's a big fear experiment is like quitting your job, getting a divorce, writing a book, starting a company. Selling hit water at Whole Foods out of the back of your Jeep, right? Or betting, putting it all on, on red, right? And hoping this works. Those are big ones, but you don't need to jump out of a plane or like yeah. free solo a mountain to be brave. You can do small everyday things. So for the person listening, that's like, Oh, how can I work that? Cause it's a muscle. Courage is a muscle. Like creativity is a muscle. So you got to use it. And so maybe. Tonight, you cook something new for dinner. Maybe you listen to a new Spotify station. Maybe you uh, change your hair color. Maybe on your next Zoom, you go on camera if that is uncomfortable for you. Maybe you start an Instagram account. Maybe you send an email to someone new on your team and ask them for a virtual coffee. 
big and small things matter, but they don't have to be huge. So we are, we are always encouraging our community to get braver by getting uncomfortable regularly on pur- purpose because comfort is the enemy, not fear. And the more we do this, the braver we get. So fear experiments are kind of our little fear. Path. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely la- love it. The other thing I talk about a lot actually is that I, part of my issue when I was leaving AOL prior to starting Hint was I was managing and I didn't feel like I was learning anymore and I couldn't articulate why I just was grumpy and, you know, I'd start blaming and I don't know, like I I would find reasons why it's someone else's fault, not mine or, Mm. you know, very (laughs) subtly. But but at the end of the day, what I finally came to the conclusion and it took me a couple of years was that I just wasn't learning anymore. So a lot of my friends who were in tech and again, I live in the Bay Area. It's like all my friends I'd grown up in tech, but all my friends that I was living by were in tech companies and I'm starting a beverage company and they're like, are you okay? I know you have four kids under the age of six and you know, is everything all right? You seem, uh, I mean, like it seems a little off. And I think that the thing that I was so fascinated by in starting this company was that I just didn't really understand it, right? Like I didn't, there were so many things. I didn't know how to create a shelf-stable product. I didn't know how to do distribution. I didn't, and so I was learning. And so today I always push on this concept, not only with my team, but also with people who are not quite happy that sometimes by not actually putting yourself in situations where you, where you're a little scared, but also where you're just, where you just have no idea what you're doing. Those are the places where ultimately maybe you'll fail at some of those things, but other things you'll, you'll figure out along the way. And that's what I found is really the happiest people I think are the people that are learning as humans. I fundamentally believe that, we are here to learn. Yeah. And when we get into situations where we're C- uh, CEOs, I have friends that are C-suite executives that are, I'm so jealous of you. You're all out there. You're learning and you, you know, it's so exciting. And I'm like, that's a choice. Do it. That's right. A choice. It's a choice. Mm-hmm. Right. But I think that that's the thing. And I've talked on college campuses about this, that nobody taught me this. And I think mm-hmm. you, have learned this on your journey as well. I mean, I'm so excited because we really are speaking the same language on this, but that's the thing that I think is, is really not focused on in sort of schools along the way where Mm -hmm. the Mecca is you become a manager, you become, you know, whether you're in sales or operations or whatever, or, and then you become a CEO and you're supposed to be really happy. And there's a lot of people who that really aren't that excited about managing people all day long. They actually want to learn. And unfortunately, the the second step of that for a lot of C-suite executives is, okay, well, maybe I'll go join a board. But when you join a board, as I share with people, you don't necessarily operate. Right. You're not learning in some way. You're actually teaching. It's not a bad thing, but you're teaching. Right. -hmm. Right? And so that's not necessarily going to solve the problem either. So anyway, it's something that I think I I think about it a lot. And I think that people think that not being afraid, like they don't fear anything, I think, (laughs) to your point, is just doesn't exist. Well, maybe you should. Maybe you should go find some fear in your life. You're doing wrong, right? I always people come to me and they're like, Oh, I'm stuck, stuck in a rut in my marriage, my business, and my company with my team. And I was my my knee jerk reaction, Kara, every single time is, When was the last time you tried something new? Or when was the last time you've done something for the first time? Because what happens, it's easy to do the same things we, the, Things the same way we've always done them. That's a comfort totally. zone. It's way more terrifying to walk out onto the karaoke stage, the proverbial karaoke stage of life and pick up that microphone and belt out your first tone. And you know what? Something else to your point, I wish they taught me in school and I learned this in improv and it was a fundamental game changer for me. And you have themes of this in your book because it happened to you time and time again. 
we have a mantra that is no mistakes, only gifts. So we're either going to go out on that stage and we're going to win, or we're going to go out onto that stage and we're going to learn something that didn't work that we won't do again. Mm -hmm. And that set me free because now failure shows up. We just had this happen with a product we launched on December 1st. There are some things that didn't go right and we made some mistakes. Oh, but we learned. And guess what? That gives me the power. It gives us the power to make things better next time, to do things different next time. And we pivot. You know, improvisers yeah. live for the plot twist. We don't run from it. We choose to see possibility and positivity. It doesn't mean things aren't going to go wrong, but I control that narrative. No one else. Right. And I can either turn it. When you, the bottom line is this, when you are in an environment at Second City where you're literally going on stage and minutes before you go on, your instructor, your coach is literally tapping everybody in the back going, Guys, I want you to go out there and I want you to fail so hard. I want you to bomb. I want you to mess this up. And in the corporate, in corporate America, Carol, I'm being told to like be myself, but not too much or like do whatever you want with the PowerPoint, but like call me first. But in improv, it was so opposite. And so it doesn't mean we don't follow the rules and be respectful of the things happening inside of our companies. But we now in my company and in any board that I'm a part of, we throw mistake parties on the regular. We celebrate the courage it takes to try something new. We get people into a room with music and cake pops and confetti masks, masks now. And some of that's virtual, but we literally throw mistake parties, failure parties, whatever you want to call them. I write about it in my book and that is empowering. I that love is it. Empowering. Yeah. That is, that's so great. So your book, which is amazing. Everybody Thank needs you. to purchase Thank it. You. And it's called Fear is My Homeboy, How to Slay Doubt, Boss Up and Succeed on Your Own Terms. You mm -hmm. talk a lot, obviously, about the fear side of things. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's your advice for people who are currently kind of feeling stuck, like not yeah. being, I mean, what, what step, what should they get out there and do tomorrow morning? Yeah. If they're feeling like they just can't really move. Yep. It. yep. I love this question. And the most tactical, practical, life-changing thing you could do in the next 24 hours is to conduct your very first fear experiment, to literally do something different, to maybe tomorrow wear a color you're not used to or Take a different drive to the grocery store or uh, go on camera. Like I said, for your Zoom, call someone that you pick up the phone and call someone versus texting them. You know what I did yesterday? I went on a walk without my phone and it was mm -hmm. amazing. It, yeah. And I've that was done a that before. Experiment. You know what I mean? We don't, anytime you are doing something just a little, get that cavity film. Now that's a big fear experiment for some of us who ate the dentist, but you get my point. Mix it up. If yeah. you are in a rut, if you want to start having more playful, more empowering conversations with your fear, you have to choose to have a different relationship with it. And uh, the easiest way to do that is to start playing with it, start dancing with it, start inviting it into your life so that when it shows up, when the real stuff shows up, because real things are going to happen, like COVID, like a pandemic, like loss of life and business, and things are going to happen. We can't avoid that. But the constant in every scenario is you and how you show up to that. And so fear experiments have just been um, something that's changed my life. And when I feel stuck, I go out there and mix it up. I love it. That's so great. What do you think people fear the most? People are so afraid to be seen starting small. Mm -hmm. People are so afraid to start small. And they look at people with these big followings or these best-selling books, and they think, oh, my God, who am I? And Listen, if you've got 25 views on your IGTV, that's a classroom. You yeah. get a couple hundred views on your I Instagram story. That's, that's a, little, a quote from that's, you. Yeah, that's like yeah. a hotel room. Ball yeah, room. that's awesome. Think about I love that. It. And we all start with one. We all have that first follower. So that's number one. And the second one I'd add, and it's the one thing you and I, we certainly we have a few, a lot of things in common, but failure. People are afraid to fail and they're afraid of judgment and they're afraid of other people and their opinions of said and perceived failure. So we have to remember, and this is a great way to sort of wrap it up. When we 
are so afraid of what other people are going to think. We're so afraid people aren't going to like us. We're so afraid people are going to judge us. And the cold hard truth is this, and I hate to break it to you, but people already don't like you. People are already judging you and they're already making fun of you. So who are you running your business for? Who are you raising those kids for? Who are you living your life for? You are everybody else. And the final point, and this is one of the mantras that hangs really big in my office. If people are already talking, let's go give them something to talk about. Let's change the world. Let's lead with love and make sure we're happy with it at the end of our lives. I love that. That is, that is so great. And you also have a podcast. Yes. And with Judy Holler, yes, which is and. so good. Yay. You're going to be on it. I'm so yes. excited. We're doing a yes. podcast swap. I know it's, so it's fun. super, super great, but I, I love that. And Thank I you. feel like so many of the guests that you have very similar to what I try and do is not only introduce cool people to my audience, but also People who are really authentic and who are just sharing it as it is. I mean, this is the, I, I talk about this a lot these days. Uh, I really believe that 2021, I mean, you talked about people don't want to show their flaws, right? They fear being too small or not having an audience or whatever. I think 2021 is going to be a year where the, top leaders, the top authors, the top, you know, the most successful people I put in quotes are the ones that are actually real. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think that that is, wow. look, I'm an early adopter on so many things. Like my whole life, I've been a little ahead of the curve, which, you know, is, it sounds great, but it's actually hard. Um, on so many levels, but I really, really believe that 2021 is going to be a, a time when people are saying, take me as I am, mm-hmm. right? And this is what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying. And mm-hmm. I think that that, and that is so much what I see in you and everything you're doing, and I'm so excited that you came to share with us today. I love, love, love it. So very great. So where do people, obviously the book, where's the best place for you, for people to get that? Thank you for asking. And, um, Instagram's probably my favorite place to hang out. I'm at Judy Holler, J-U-D-I-H-O-L-L-E-R. I'm sure we'll link up in the show notes. And then my website has all kinds of great information. I've got a book, a workbook, a brand new planner, and um, Vibe and Thrive Academy that just rolled out. So teaching people how to use the science of goal-focused planning in order to thrive in life, but also protect their mental health along the way. So we do a lot of work in the, the mental health area and um, really proud of that and um, love to see people continue to be successful. So um, Instagram is probably my favorite, but my website has all the good information. That's so great. Okay, Yay. great. So Judy Holler, at, it's H-O-L-L-E-R dot com. Yes. Thank you so <laughs> much, Judy. This was so super, super great. So thanks everybody for tuning yeah. in and like this uh, episode and subscribe and all that stuff. And we are here every Monday and Wednesday with all kinds of amazing guests that really make you think and inspire and all that good stuff. So thanks everybody. Have a great week.